Chapter 2.10, Our Alternative Media and Processes, Part 1. So we're going to get into really the 20th century and 21st century pretty exclusively here. Um, we're going to look at the back story and the, influence, the people that influenced and um, predated conceptualism. And then we'll get into um, how that played out in the later 20th century. So we're breaking down the traditional boundaries between art and life. So um, we're getting into blurring a lot of divisions and changing some staid or set ways of interacting. We're going to get into that with performance art. And then actions and ideas are important rather than the physical product. And these can be interactive. That's the beginning of interactive art. And it's going to incorporate one more than one time a medium. Okay, so it's not strictly painting, it's not strictly um, sculpture, it can be a combination of those things. So if you think about Rauschenberg, he's a good example of that. So in the 20th century, artists explored new ideas about art, actions, text, and environments, and uh, the influence of Jackson Pollock and his action paintings of the 50s moved through some of the painting that we're going to see, and also the fact that when he's working, it was sort of performative, and I've, I've heard that in grad school. Your work has a performative aspect. You hear that a lot. So works themselves tend to last for a very short period of time. Um, there's not like a thing that's made, if that makes sense. There's no documentation. Not always, but I mean, there is some, but there's no like object, if that makes sense. So Jackson Pollock here, we looked at this in painting a little bit where he's dripping the, the paint directly onto the floor kind of flinging it around so like the layer of black would be fling he'd step over fling 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 and then backward again and make more black and then he'd layer it with some gray layer it with some white so it's it's a exhaustive physical process and it really was about capturing the motion so in some ways, this is a document of his motion being um, uh, trapped in the paint. So the idea is the con with conceptual art, which Jackson Pollock is an abstract expressionist. Don't get me wrong; he influenced the thinking, but he is an abstract expressionist painter. He's not really a conceptual artist. But the ideas of what he was doing and it was well documented and, and shown on television, things like that. Him painting his paintings. So that started to make other artists think, and um, also before Pollock, many years before Duchamp, in the in the nineteen uh, in the teens, nineteen sixteen, around that time, he's a Dadaist. We go back to Hannah Hawk. Um, he would she was also a Dadaist, but he is a Dadaist in a different way. Like the way he works is differently, uh, but the same intent. So he opens up conceptual art. That's one of the things he influences. Is important to know because it can be on your midterm or sorry, final, I think. Um, so you're going to make art from everyday things, found objects. That's also Duchamp. A lot of things are Duchamp, uh, that he is the source for a lot of the ways that uh, we make art today. So this is a very famous piece called Fountain in 1917. So over 100 years old, he put a urinal in a museum. Oh my God, shocking. So his idea was by transporting an actual made object, a factory made object, and recontextualizing it by taking it out of a bathroom and putting it into the gallery, it therefore is art. He signs it here, 1917, R. Mutt. So he signs this piece. We're assuming it's clean, <laughs> but we don't really know. And this gets replicated. Originals, His originals get lost. Because they're real objects, and sometimes a janitor will come in and say, oh, well, I don't know who left that thing in here. We're going to go throw that out or go install it somewhere, you know. So that did happen to him in a couple cases, and you'll see another example from the book as well, I believe. Okay, so uh, Homage to New York is later. This is John Tingley. He's a Swiss artist working in New York. Um, and we don't look at a kinetic work right here of Duchamp's, but... Kinetic work, as well as conceptual art, and this actually is both here, uh, are from Duchamp. And Duchamp used bicycle wheels in, in his kinetic works. But this is a moving, smoking um, piece of artwork. It makes a lot of noise, bangs on the cans and all kinds of stuff. It's like a little drum machine type thing here. All this stuff happening. So this is homage to New York here about the noise and... Um, 
you know, uh, mechanization of New York City. So it's an assemblage. Now remember, assemblage is, is really given to Rauschenberg for taking all these found objects into his work. But if you go behind Rauschenberg, you get to Joseph Cornell. He makes these boxes and he starts to assemblage and collage different elements. Assemblage is three-dimensional. Collage is two-dimensional. So newspaper, photos, that's collage. Assemblage are objects and three-dimensional things thrown in together. Usually in both cases, collage and assemblage, they're discarded junk, okay? So in that way, that's where we're connecting here with uh, Duchamp, because Duchamp is the beginning of assemblage art, also known as found object art and ready-mades. We'll get into that. Slightly different, um, slightly different words, a little bit different meaning, but the same general idea. This piece self-destructed unpredictably, um, and it's swirring and smoking and flames are shooting out. And, um, yeah, so it was intense. It was in this courtyard um, in the MoMA Museum. So another artist we're going to look at is Barbara Kruger. Belief plus doubt equals sanity. Um, her work is more highly specifically po um, politically charged, social commentary for her. She does a lot of work on feminism and the, the female gaze or gazing on the female um, face and flesh. So plenty should be enough. These, uh, from the what the book is saying, and I'm not familiar with this particular work, but this is a, uh, a bunch of found uh, images, like the eye. These are not photographs she took. Found images of eyes and found um, texts and words. So some of these phrases are probably something like this. You want it, you buy it, you forget it. That might be a uh, advertising slogan. So she's take retext contextualizing the slogans in giant text pieces, and then she usually uses like vinyl stickers that are temporary. Um, this is the Hirschhorn in. DC and she put this along the escalator um, ramps here and on the floor and all over. She does do some billboards and things like that. There's other ways she adheres her work to surfaces, um, sometimes in a gorilla manner, just sort of puts it up on a wall, but a lot of times she does have permission from a museum such as this. This one's a bit slick and it's just very clean edges, but giant letters just overwhelming you and getting your attention. So they're to think about consumerism, feminist, uh, socially co conscious overtones. Um, just a re when you recontextualize something, you give it a new meaning. Okay, appropriation is another way to to um, talk about this, but we'll get it more into that. 